Okay, hello people. Welcome back to the Renaissance Woodworker Live. I'm Shannon Rogers, I'm your host tonight. Welcome into my shop. Uh, tonight, I'm gonna talk a little bit about hand sawing. Uh, I get questions about hand sawing all the time. Generally, they revolve around, I can't saw a straight line to save my life, or it's straight across the face, but it goes crazy off plumb, so it's, it's not square along the edge over and over and over and over again. Um, so I've done multiple videos over the years that address both sawing at a bench hook, sawing um, with uh, a hand saw, both on the bench top, but also on a saw bench, but they're kind of all scattered all over the place. So I wanted to take a little bit of time tonight and, and present it all at once. So it's kind of, uh, in the future, you're gonna have kind of a one-stop shop that I can point people to. You can get tips on how to saw straight, how to saw efficiently, and how to correct any issues that you may be seeing just by being able to diagnose your own body mechanics. And while I'm on that topic, one of the most important things, one of the most helpful things you can do to correct your own sawing is to simply film yourself. Grab your smartphone, grab a camera, grab whatever you have, and film yourself sawing both straight on like this and then sawing in profile. Capture both of those. Hey, if you've got two cameras, do it all at once and you could save time. But it's amazing how you can see little body mechanics issues where your elbow pops out to the side or you're leaning one way or another that you don't really recognize until you kind of have that out of body experience. That simple thing will go a long, long way. So tonight I'll be able to give you a few things that you should look for should you decide to film yourself later on. And then after that, it's up to you guys in the chat room. Let me know what's on your mind, what questions you have. Anything is fair game. So, um, uh, as always, if you're in the chat room and you do have specific questions, I would love it if you can put them in all caps. It just makes it a lot easier for me to see, even on the big screen over in the corner, just to separate the, um, the, the chat from the questions, if you will, the, the wheat from the chat. Um, also, uh, I've got a space here running in the corner because it is butt cold outside right now. If that gets to be distracting, somebody just speak up and, and I'll suck it up buttercup and turn the heat back. So let's start, um, let's start at the bench hook. It makes the most sense. Uh, I have specifically done a video in the past on sawing at the bench hook. I, I just call it fix your sawing with a single step back. And I'll review that real quickly here, but real quickly because I do have a pretty comprehensive video on that. If you're sawing, on the workbench, if you're doing work with a back saw, joiner saw, or any kind of precision sawing on the workbench, you're gonna be using a bench hook for this. And you hear about people all the time who maybe have trouble, their saw cut is a little off square, but most importantly, usually their saw cut is off plumb. And that's what gets people a lot. So let me go ahead and draw a couple of lines across the board, and that may be the first thing that's a good idea, is how do you know if you're sawing square if you don't have any lines to work towards? So um, as you're doing any practice cuts, or not even practice cuts, just um, actual precision project cuts, feel free to lay a line all the way around the board so you've actually got something to track to. You actually can do a fair amount of steering with a back saw cut. As you feel you're starting to deviate from, uh, from the line, it's relatively easy just to tweak the wrist or whatever to bring it back online. Now you may widen your saw curve a little bit, but if you're widening it towards the waist side, no harm, no foul, right? So first things first, let me uh, go ahead and put just a little bit of light on this. Let me zoom in a little bit and Oh, too far. I've talked about this reflection trick a fair amount, but I want to revisit it here. If you have um, certainly a nice new polished saw like this Bad X, it's really easy to see your reflection. But even if you don't have a, a freshly polished one, if you have a, a more of a vintage saw, you'd be surprised just... Eh, I'm not going to pull that out right now. You'd be surprised just how much reflection you can see even on a duller saw plate. But if your saw plate is so dull you're not seeing any reflection, then it's a matter of you need to polish that up. Grab some metal polish and some steel wool and try to polish that up. Be careful that you're not going to ruin your saw plate. But if you use fine enough steel wool or even a scotch Bright pad, it's, you're not going to really tear up the saw plate. But you do want to be able to see some reflection. And what I would be doing is looking at my side of the reflection, but that's a little hard to do with the camera angle. So I'll... Uh, 
position the saw on my line, and as I move side to side, the reflection in the saw plate of my wood right here, it's going to change. And if I am a square cut, this intersection, the line of the actual wood into the reflection will be a straight line. If it's off at all, you're going to see an angle form between your reflection and reality. Likewise, if I'm off on the plumb side of things, you're going to see an angle from reality to reflection. So if I'm straight up and down and I sight in there, I should see a straight line both laterally and vertically. And that is a great way to start your cut. Position that reflection so it looks good. And then before I do anything, and this is where when I talk about my, my step back video, this is what I'm talking about. I'm going to position the saw nice and square. I'm going to relax my grip a little bit and I want to sight down my arm. I want to see that my wrist to my elbow to my shoulder are all in the same geometric plane. Then I want to take a step back. And what that step back does is step back with the sawing side. So I'm sawing left handed. I'm going to step back with my left foot. What that does is it actually rotates the body and it moves my torso out of the way of my sawing stroke. So this straight geometric plane from wrist to elbow to shoulder now doesn't have my torso pushing it out of the way. That step back automatically changes things and it should be comfortable. It should lower your center of gravity and allow for you to be able to make a nice straight saw cut. Now here's the next thing, especially when we're doing precision saw cuts, joinery, back saw cuts or whatever, I don't want to start with a series of back cuts to get a curve started. And I did that in the way specifically. So now I want to come back to my line. I want to start on the push stroke. Those back cuts create a drunken curve, kind of a ragged curve that it's wider than what your saw actually wants to create. And it's not putting your best foot forward. So what you want to do in order to get the saw to start cleanly on the push stroke, you have to take all the weight off the toe. And this applies to back saws, hand saws, panel saws, whatever. To do that, this lower horn on the handle is really important because I can tweak my wrist up and I can feel that lower horn biting into the heel of my hand. And what that's doing is taking weight, the cantilevered weight off the toe. And it allows me to start cleanly on the push strip. And make my saw cut. <clears throat> and I am square across the width and I'm square, I know that's a little far away, but I'm square across the thickness. And I didn't really do anything here. All I did was line up, check my reflection, line up my body, make sure wrist, elbow, shoulder, all right, take that step back so that my body's out of the way of my shoulder and essentially, I call this no look sawing because I can look right up at my camera, not even paying attention to the saw cut. And I end up with a square cut and a plum cut. Once you get everything set up, you're essentially on autopilot. If you don't move your body or anything, that saw is going to want to track true. Now I'm assuming that the saw is, is tuned properly, that it's set properly, that it's not going to pull one way or another due to improper set. But once you actually get that started, and if you stay relaxed in hand, keep your body out of the way, and just keep sawing, you're not going to, you're not going to deviate from that cut. Which brings me to my next point. You want to use as much of the saw plate as possible. Certainly, the more saw teeth you use, the faster the cut's going to go, the more your saw plate is going to wear evenly. But here's the other thing. If you, I, I call this dibbling. If you take little saw cuts like this, you are asking the saw to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth many, many more times than if you took a full length cut. Well, every time I go forward and back, there's tiny little body mechanics issues that are happening that could shift my wrist out of alignment, shift my shoulders out of alignment, just muck up the works essentially. So the more I take long strokes, the more I'm relying upon the actual straightness of the saw plate to keep my cut straight. I can take little cuts like this and I can actually 
turn my saw. And you can actually create like a bent cut by doing this, just by working kind of on that single point. You can't bend the cut when you're taking these long saw cuts. So that's the one thing that I see a lot of people doing. They, they kind of dibble, they're, they're afraid to go past their line or they're trying to trace their line back across the cut and they, they take these short little strokes. Commit to it. Check your reflection. Check your wrist, elbow and shoulder alignment. Take that step back, settle into a nice relaxed cut, lift the weight off the toe and make that. Commit to it. The entire saw plate is at, at work here. And commit to it on every single stroke. And you'll end up with a much uh, flatter, straighter I should say, saw cut. I compare this to a hand plane. If you want a really flat board, you're going to use a longer hand plane because the long straight sole of that joiner plane is going to give you a flatter cut. Likewise, I've got 40, 10, 14 inches of saw plate here. Why would I only use two inches? I want to use the full 14 inches or as much as possible to end up with as straight a cut as I possibly can. So there's the first thing. That's bench hook work and getting nice straight saw cuts. The same thing could be said for vertical work on a vise. If I'm saying sawing, we'll start with dovetails and moving on to tenons. Um, see, there's a couple questions. I'll get to them in just a second. The exact same principle here. I'm going to set, say I'm sawing a dovetail. I'm going to set it on my line. I'm going to position my wrist, shoulder, everything in line, take that step back. I'm going to lift the weight off the toe. I'm going to make the cut. In this case, if I'm sawing a dovetail or whatever, there's, there's so much less real estate I'm sawing through. So, you know, a couple of cuts on up to the base of a dovetail. A tenon, same thing. And this is really where making that whole saw cut. In fact, let me grab my tenon saw. My favorite tenon saw, this 18 inch Bad axe saw, I've had this sucker for, shoot, six years, something like that. But this saw, it's fantastic at making tenon cuts because it's a super long plate. Well, I'm gonna set it on my line, I'm gonna check my alignment, I'm gonna take that step back, I'm gonna take the weight off the toe, and I'm gonna, whoops, tighten that up first. I'm gonna commit to that with that full length cut. And one thing you can do if you're a little uncertain about tracing that line across the end grain, you can actually transfer your weight from your back leg to your front leg, kind of keep your arms stationary and move my shoulders forward. You see this elbow is, is barely even bending. I'm moving forward almost from my, from my ankles or my hip, I suppose, and keeping the shoulder, elbow and everything static. And what that's doing, is kind of eliminating all of these hinges, all these variables, and will track a very straight line across the end grain. Once it's established, then you can kind of step back and you can use your arm to do the work. Because obviously doing this is slower than using the saw as is intended. But that's a great way to get the cut started. And as you can see, this is that no look sawing I'm talking about. Everything is in line. I know I'm not moving my body, so there's no reason why the cut should change from its geometric plane. Same thing would apply for resawing here. But this is some really soft poplar I'm working on. I'm like more than halfway through a resaw of this cut already. So let me look at a, a few questions here. <laughs> this is great. Thank you, John. I appreciate you asking this because there's probably a lot of people who probably wouldn't ask this. Do I know anything about a saw company called Distin? Is this saw worth anything? Distin, the Henry Distin company is probably the most famous saw company on the planet. They made millions, millions of saws um, in uh, uh, the 1800s and into the 1900s. They are probably the premier saw maker, probably the most prolific saw maker out there. As far as are they worth something? Yes and no, certain models are worth a lot. Most models aren't worth all that much because there were so many of them made. They're great saws though, especially the ones that are made pre-World War II 
and the late 1800 saws are absolutely beautiful. Um, the Distonian Institute, I think it's distonianinstitute.com, is a great place to go to figure out um, the provenance and the date of your saw by checking the, the handle shape, the medallions, the hardware, the saw itself. But absolutely, great saw, definitely a user. So um, again, anybody who has questions, please, if you can, put them in all caps. I can't tell if there's some other questions over here or not. Um, yeah, and that was probably answered. Um, my distant question was probably answered already anyway. So that's, that's back saw cutting, precision cutting. It's all about that step back. And again, the step back frees up my sawing arm. I mean, you could just see as I'm standing here at the camera, if I square off my shoulders, as my arm comes back, square to the camera, as my arm comes back, it has to kind of bump out and around. I'm exaggerating here, obviously. It has to bump out and around, especially if you've got some love handles like me. And what's happening is the wrist is bending and those little tiny things, they, they may not seem like much, but they'll add up and they'll cause a cut to start to waver. This is why so many of you guys write me and say, I start out fine, but I get like half the way through the cut and suddenly my, my, cuts, my cuts just starts to drift. It's like, I started great, what happened? Um, it's because those tiny little errors start to compound and it's sending the saw off. But if I take a step back, what happens? See how my torso rotated? Now my arm can move perfectly freely. So back saw work, bench work at a bench hook, it's all about taking the step back. I say that because now when we move to hand saws, and again, semantics lesson, a hand saw, as I saw it without a back, that's 26 or greater inches long. A panel saw is a saw without a back that's about 18 to 24 inches long, also known as a toolbox saw. A full-size backless saw is just called a hand saw. So when you're doing hand saw work or if you're doing panel saw work, we'll say backless saw work, it's a little bit different. And a lot of times it's not a step back that fixes your, your errant saw cuts, but a step forward that fixes them because there's a different physics. There's different. I'm going to focus primarily on sawing on a saw bench. And that's going to be the first thing. If you're having issues with a hand saw or a panel saw and you're sawing up on a workbench, probably it's because it's too high. The, the presentation angle, the angle with which the teeth cut most efficiently and work most in concert with your body mechanics for a backless saw like this is down lower than the workbench. You saw this saw cuts really well when it's pretty much parallel to the surface of the bench. The hang angle, in other words, means that it cuts well when this line is parallel to the bench. Some dovetail saws have a different hang angle. It's a higher hang angle so that what, where it cuts most effectively is when the saw is tilted up like this. Um, I've got a dovetail saw right here that is a perfect example of that. When I hold this Bontz dovetail saw in a relaxed manner, look at that. The angle is way up like that as compared to the hang angle of this saw, which this... Um, sash saw, 14 inch saw, is meant for the type of work you just saw me doing, or cutting dados. I use this to cut dados across wide case stock. You can see more of the teeth are registered. If this were my case side, it falls in line. Tackling it this way, that doesn't make any sense. But if I'm cutting a dovetail, like I just did, this is fantastic. Because a lot of times what we'll do is start that angle cut and I tilt the handle up in order to work across the end grain. And it makes more sense to focus on working down the face first and then working across the end grain. So the hang angle of dovetail saw is very, very different. The reason I bring that up is because the hang angle and the presentation angle, the geometry of the teeth and everything for a backless saw is meant to work downward. It's meant to work on a rip saw. It works best at about 60 degrees. Crosscut saw works best at about 45 degrees. Well, if I'm standing even on this relatively low uh, joiner style workbench, I'm up way too high. And it's, I'm already forcing the saw to work at a much, much shallower angle than where it wants to work. And obviously if I tilt it up at 60 degrees, now look at my arm. There's just no way to do this. That's why a lot of times you'll see 
an overhand sawing method where I'll take a board and I'll clamp it down to my bench top and I'll actually work vertically 90 degrees. That works pretty well if I'm working up higher. I have a video, um, one of my shop updates that specifically talks about sawing with one of these saws if you don't have a saw bench or if kneeling on a saw bench is just uncomfortable for you. I know there's a lot of folks out there that have bad knees that can be kind of an issue. But let me shut up. Let's go to the saw bench. So what I want to do, let me first use my panel gauge and put a line down here. I want to rip this live edge off this piece of poplar. And I've already jointed this edge, in case anybody's wondering. I will go ahead and mark both sides of a cut. This is not a very long cut, so I don't know that it's really all that necessary. Uh, I'm so glad. Mark uh, Dennehy wants to know, how did the body mechanics change for using Japanese saws like Ryoba's? Interestingly enough, not all that much. You hear this from a lot of people who, who, who ask this question and want to know, you know, well, you're talking about Western saws. It's totally different with the Japanese saw. Surprisingly, it's not. And I'm going to pull out a Ryoba just so that I remember to talk about this. Let me do the rip cut first with the Western saw. I don't have a very nice Ryoba. This is horribly pitched for what we want to do, and it's a little dusty, which is why I'm wiping it down right now. I'm going to pull out the Ryoba, and I'll make that cut in just a second, and I'll show you how there's not a lot of difference. So, by the way, this is the new Bad Axe. Um, it's modeled after the Distant D8 saw. Um, Love this saw. In fact, I actually, as soon as I'm done with this demonstration, I'm going to put it in a box and send it back to Mark Harrell because uh, he sent me, I bought the thumb hole grip and he sent me the right-handed thumb hole grip and I'm a lefty. So I'm going to send it back and have him replace the handle because Mark's an upstanding businessman. Businessman. All right. So I've got my line here. I'm going to kneel on my work to hold it in place. As I'm sawing now, one of the biggest issues is with a narrow saw bench is a lot of times you'll feel kind of you cramp. You don't have that much space. It's one of the reasons that I like a wider saw bench. This saw bench is about 11 inches wide. It's got the ripping notch down the middle. That's kind of nice, really only for like very thin pieces where if I try to put a knee on this on the far side, there's really just no place for it. So the ripping notch is nice to put it in the middle. But honestly, I rarely use that ripping notch anymore. I'm usually going to be sawing off the other side of the bench like I'm showing here just because when I'm further away, I've got my body is already automatically out of my way. I don't have any issues with my arm having to jog around my torso. I also have another shop update video where I talk about where I most like to do rip sawing is not on the saw bench, but actually in front of the saw bench by using an additional bit of support one of these guys, oops, one of these saw bents, which is all caught up in my HDMI cables right now. That's poor planning. Come on, just trying not to unplug any of the cameras. This saw bent will sit out here and provide support so that, let me just grab one of these narrow strips. I can actually balance and saw in between them. And the reason that I bring that up is because the step forward that is required for good sawing while ripping is going to drive everything off the front edge of the bench. And here's why. I'm going to position in here. Everything's good. Set it on my line. I'm going to pull back. And again, I'm not doing a pullback cut. I'm actually just moving to the toe here, taking the weight off the saw. <gasps> starting that cut. You saw it committed full length of the saw. So if you've marked a line down your ingrain, you generally at this point can see, okay, I'm plumb and I'm working along my line. And this is what most people say. Started out great. A couple inches in, eight inches, 12 inches in, things started going wrong. Well, why is that? As I work back towards my body, back along this line, I'm getting more and more cramped. My arm is having to work its way into my torso. 
I'm, my arm can only go back so far. And as I move further and further back, I'm having to actually twist my torso to pull the saw back. Well, as I twist, let's just examine this. As I twist, look what happens. The saw plate moved off the line. I want to continue to move straight up and down, twisting my torso, twisting at my wrist, moving my shoulders, pulls that saw offline. And this is why people tend to want to drift towards them. Or they start to drift towards themselves and they think, oh, I got to fix that. So they lean the other way and they put a bend into the saw. They start to hear a lot of rattling and vibration in the saw and they overcorrect and send it the other direction. Moreover, what tends to happen is you're trying to move a little bit out of the way of the saw. Well, now look what happens. I'm bending the saw to the, to the right and I'm pulling it off plumb. So you may be able to see your pencil line up top here and you're thinking, hey, I'm on that, I'm great, I'm doing great. And you pull a square out afterwards and you find that you've got this bevel into the side because you're so focused on leaning out of the way of the saw that you've actually tilted it off to the side. So here's how we avoid all that. It can be very difficult to, to actually diagnose in the cut exactly what you're doing wrong. Again, filming yourself will help with this a lot. The step back at the back saw with the back saw just got my body entirely out of the way. Well, to do that here, I'll position my body, again, kneeling on, on the work with my standing leg, in my case, my right leg, my non-sawing arm, I'll step forward. And I'm stepping pretty far forward to the point where my center of gravity is almost falling forward a little bit. Well, what that has now done is move my entire torso ahead of my elbow. And it allows me to saw without any interference of my body at all. And as I can move further and further back, I'll continue to move the board forward. And this is why I like sawing in between the saw bench and a saw bench, because I keep my weight forward like this, and I just continue to move the board forward. Now, there does get to be a point where you get to the end of the board, and <laughs> there's no place left to kneel on it. So at this point, I have to just use my hand to hold it down. But right off the bat, now I'm un unclenching my body, if you will. And I've got more room to work with. This is not as efficient of a saw stroke. And you can see the wood wants to slide around a little bit. It doesn't help there's a little bit of a cup here as well that's causing it to want to slide around. But, straight edge. This cut certainly is right on my pencil line. That is pretty dang flat. And again, I say pretty dang flat because that's a coarse tooth saw. That's a five points per inch saw. And, This cut, see that? That is a plumb cut all the way down. That I think is the most important part to hit. Getting the vertical aspect, this plane right, because it's really hard to judge when you're over top of it. You can look down at your pencil line and see if I'm deviating this way or that, but it's a straight up and down part that can be hard to tell. And frankly, people have a lot harder time squaring that up with a plane than they do flattening it out or pulling it back to the line. That's a whole other issue. If you're curious about jointing edges, check out one of my live sessions from like earlier in 2017, where I talked specifically about that. I spent the whole hour talking about it. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that body position perfectly sets the saw at its 60 degree presentation angle. And it's in a very efficient cut. It cut really fast. Granted, this is pretty soft poplar, so it's gonna cut faster than you know, oak or something like that. But still, um, there's really not a lot of exertion, physical exertion involved here. My heart rate's a little elevated right now, but really nothing you know, that doesn't allow me to keep presenting and talking to you guys. So that's the other thing to think about. Appropriate body mechanics are just more efficient. It just means that you're gonna saw easier uh, without you know, killing yourself. So quickly, let me uh, Bill wants to know if I wax the plate of my saws. I do. 
not, uh, not a huge amount. Um, with something like Poplar like this, it's not something that I'm, I'm really focused on a whole lot. If I'm working with a really long rip cut, like these eight foot long pieces of walnut that I ripped out, um, you end up getting a fair amount of binding and I will, uh, I will wax the saw plate. If I'm making a cut more into the interior of the board, here I just ripped off a little edge piece so there's a little bit more flex on this narrower piece. If I'm working right in the middle of a board, I'm gonna see a lot more compression, um, just the way the grain is formed, so I will end up waxing a saw. Uh, in fact, I have a block of paraffin wax that's just sitting right here on the wall, right next to my saw bench when I wanna use it. Um, I've also got one up here for my joinery saws. And because I haven't used this Ryoba much, I'm gonna go ahead and wax the saw plate. Um, somebody asked a question about saw nuts, um, how to loosen them. Um, the traditional ones are split nuts. You need a split nut driver to do that. Or you can take a regular old screwdriver and with a grinder, grind a little kind of fork in the middle so it looks like a forked tongue. As far as where to buy them, you know, you can buy vintage saw nuts on eBay. Um, I like to go to Blackburn Toolworks. Um, Isaac has a lot of different saw nuts. You could even talk to guys that make saws now, like Bad Axe. I don't know if Mark will sell them to you, but you can certainly ask him and you can get uh, saw nuts there. But for the vintage market, you a lot of times have to end up buying saws for parts. Buy a beat up, rusty, nasty Diston and take its medallion and saw nuts and restore them from there. So, uh, okay. The Ryoba, I should lay out a line here, but I'm not going to. Same thing with Ryoba, but now obviously I'm pulling. I'm pulling the board or the saw towards me. So obviously I'm not starting on the push stroke here. So where with the Western saw, I pulled down to the toe and I struck, now I'm gonna go down to the heel and pull it towards me. Wow, this is a bad saw. The presentation angle is a little bit different. It's a little bit lower than the um, Western saw. What that usually means is that you're better off placing the work a little bit lower than I would for this Western saw bench. This Western saw bench, if you notice, is set to be right about knee height. I'm very comfortable resting my knee here, but in order to hit the appropriate presentation angle, if I go up to 60 degrees, it, it's wanting to grab on me a little bit more. It's wanting to stutter uh, and give me a little bit of problems. If I drop the saw down, it's going to saw smoother, more efficiently, which could be done just by changing the height a little bit. So what you may find if you are a Japanese saw user, you can still use the same, this is a really finely pitched Ryoba. It's gonna take forever to make this rip cut. But what you'll find is pull out your, your Ryoba and start making cuts and changing the, the angle of attack. And you feel it start to grab as you go higher. You feel it smooth out. You feel it start to skate over the wood and barely do any cutting. You can also hear the pitch change. It's more of a shushing sound than the growling cutting sound that happens at its optimum angle. And you can pretty much just by feel alone figure out what the optimum angle is for that saw and for most of the Ryobas and figure out how high you want to put your saw bench at that point. Um, a lot of uh, Japanese sawing uses little low trestles and things like that. And you can actually stand on the board and saw. But the, the grip, the body alignment, setting everything up, aligning your body, moving your body out of the way of your arm is exactly the same. In fact, I would say even more so since these plates are so much more flexible, so much thinner, you can steer the cut a lot more if your body is forcing it to go weird places. So um, again, I'm not a, a huge Japanese saw user. So there are a lot of folks out there who um, can speak with a lot more authority on Japanese saws than, than I can. But I've spoken, <laughs> I spent some time speaking to people who have better authority on Japanese saws and they agree with me that there's really not a massive difference. It's all, it's pulling versus pushing. And there's really not a huge amount of, of um, dramatic difference from there. So now let's do a cross cut because while there is a step forward here, it's a little bit different. Square line across.
Richard Decker wants to know, where does the panel saw enter the equation? Um, I'm not sure what you're asking there, other than the fact that the panel saw, that is a panel saw, that is a hand saw. Notice the length difference. The panel saw, I actually like to refer to these because it's less confusing, because everybody wants to call a backless saw a panel saw. I like to refer to these as toolbox saws, as the kind of 20th century version. Um, they called them toolbox saws because they were sized to fit nicely in a toolbox. Um, where the term panel saw can be appropriate is this saw is going to be shorter, it's going to be finer pitch. This is a rip saw, but it's pitched at 10, uh, 10 points per inch, whereas this rip saw is pitched at 5 points per inch. It's a much coarser cut, meant to go through thicker stock. This is meant to go through thinner stock, aka a panel that's already been planed and dimensioned, is probably less than an inch, maybe even 3 quarters of an inch thick the finer pitch is going to cut through there and it's going to leave a cleaner cut, which means as your panel, as your board moves closer to finished, you don't want to use a really, really coarse saw that's going to require a lot of planing to clean up those saw cuts. If I have a, like a, a frame and panel and a frame and panel door um, and I'm just sizing it to final dimensions to fit into the grooves of the frame that I've already built for it, I don't want to have to do a whole bunch of planing. I want to make a finer, cleaner saw cut and that's where the panel saw comes into play technique is all exactly the same. It's the same physics, the same mechanism. It's just a finer pitch and a shorter saw plate. A lot of times I'll end up doing more panel saw work up on my Rubo workbench in a vertical orientation just because I tend to already be there anyway. I'm doing joinery. I just raised a panel or something like that. I'm already at the workbench. Rather than stopping, coming over to my saw bench, I'll just stay at the Rubo and use a panel saw for that. Um, so that's how they fit into the equation. If you meant something else by that question, uh, Richard, please restate it. Uh, how many Japanese saws do I have? Ray wants to know. Uh, two. I have a flush cut saw and I have the Ryoba that you just saw. Um, I've had more in the past. I just don't use them all that much anymore, so there's no reason to have a bunch of them. Um, Sean, uh, I will certainly answer this, but again, uh, folks, if you can put questions in all caps, it makes it so much easier for me to see them. Sean wants to know if there's a rule of thumb for length of cut you will attempt with a joinery saw before moving to a backless hand or panel saw. No, no length of cut. It comes to depth of cut. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong camera. It's depth of cut. Um, with a back saw, obviously you're limited by the back and how deep that cut can go. Um, I shouldn't say that. I mean, I don't want to make a dado cut in a 12 inch wide board like this with a six inch back saw. Um, but I mean, this is not that wide that I wouldn't try to attempt it. Usually it comes down to a pitch issue um, and a hang issue. If I'm cutting a dado, I want a saw that's going to be hung nicely to work with that dado. If I've got one that's hung dramatically like a, a dovetail saw or hung more like a panel saw, you're, it's just going to be more awkward. So I adjust from there. It really has little to do with the length. From an efficiency perspective, I can use a 12 inch carcass saw on here and it does a fine job, but a 14 inch sass saw just works faster, more efficiently because that longer saw plate allows excavation of sawdust a little bit better. Um, short answer, no, there's no rule of thumb for there. Um, you can use a carcass saw for just about all the work you need to do. When you get to the point in your sawing career, like me, where you like start getting specialized saws for specialized tasks, that's when you bring a sash saw in specifically for wider dados, focus on a carcass saw for other crosscut stuff. Um, so yeah, not a huge uh, rule of thumb there. Uh, okay, crosscut saw. Can we have a good angle here? Let's move this way. So here I can actually uh, assume a little bit more of a squared shoulder aspect. I'm going to put my opposite knee on the board now. Instead of ripping where I use the same side, I'm going to use the opposite side. And this is where people generally start. Same thing applies. I'll come up and I'll just let the saw fall and start that cut. I can now kind of hold the second point of contact with my hand here and hold it. And this will, sawing like this, will start out just fine. But probably a couple inches into the cut, things are going to start to go awry. Problems are going to happen. And the reason for that is with this leg stepped back, essentially, my shoulders are now twisted. So again, that same twisting action that pulls the saw off the line, I'm already in that aspect. 
I may feel like my shoulders are square and I may have my shoulders square when I'm standing up. But when I lean forward, bam, everything just rotated. Everything just twisted. So I have to take a step forward again. And the good news is, is this serves not only to align my shoulders, but it serves as work holding. I will step forward, put this knee, my sawing knee, right up against the back of the board. And if I'm sawing a narrower board, like this piece I just cut off, I'm going to move it to the side of the bench that's nearest to me. So I can position the kneel on the board and then press my other knee right up against the back of that board. That rotates my shoulders back. It's a little bit awkward when you're working with a really narrow piece like this. But as I'm sawing now, I'm able to keep that alignment throughout the cut. So again, let's do this on a longer saw cut. Honestly, to go back to the question earlier about length of saw for cuts, if I wanted to make a cross cut on a narrow piece like this, I probably would do that at a bench hook um, just because why not? A wider board like this and a rough cut, again, clamping in place, moving this knee up behind it. Now it's preventing the board from sliding back, but also aligning my shoulders and allowing me to saw efficiently and in perfect alignment. Whoops, I forgot I made that rip cut back there. My square. I am square across the face. How do we do here? I'm square across the thickness. So that is, I, I would say, pretty much a perfect cut. Now, I say all of this, all of this stuff, all this step forwards and step backs in order to get a, quote, perfect cut. We're working with coarser pitch saws here. We're going to create a rougher edge. We're, in other words, we have to go back and, and address that edge with a plane. We have to joint it with a joiner plane or something like that, maybe. Unless that edge is buried in a groove or something and nobody really cares, you're gonna do additional work to it. So does it have to be perfect? Does it have to be perfectly square and perfectly plumb? No, it doesn't because that's what the plane can do later. However, if you have gotten it flat-ish and square-ish, you can joint that edge with one or two joiner plane strokes as compared to 10 or 12 joiner plane strokes. The underlying theme in all handwork is we are the problem. <laughs> we are the, the error between keyboard and chair. We are the human error that this saw wants to saw straight. It wants to saw at a certain angle. It's a schmucks that pull it off angle, that pull it off that presentation angle. The more that we're involved in things, the more we screw it up. So think of it this way. Again, longer saw plate strokes means less back and forth, more time for the saw to do its work. Fewer joiner plane strokes means fewer opportunities for me to screw the whole thing up. If I make two joiner plane strokes and I've got a flat edge and a square edge, all the better. I may start out with two strokes and I have to make eight more, I'm liable to screw it up in the process of those eight more cuts. So yes, the rougher cut does leave a lot more room to true things up later, but the more you have to true things up later, the more opportunity there is for mistakes. So I don't want to necessarily give people the impression that they've got to be dead on with these rough saws. If you're doing rough stock breakdown, the squareness of that cut, if I'm you know, breaking down an eight quarter by 12 piece of walnut into smaller parts, I don't even care. A lot of times I won't even mark out the line. I'll just do a, you know, a lumber crayon at approximately you know, 12 inches, 24 inches, wherever it is, and I'll cut across just kind of squaring by eye. And I'll worry about the precision a little bit later on. But there are certainly times when you want to get that cut as close as you can to save on work further down the road. This is the coarse tool, the plane is the medium tool, and then whatever joiner work after that is the fine tool in that coarse, medium, and fine spectrum. Uh, was that Ripsaw a Sandovic? Yes, I think it is, yeah. I've had this for so many years, you know? No, it's a Hecken Rose. I think they're all the same, honestly. They just kind of like Grizzly and Powermatic, they just slap a different paint coat on them and 
call them different brands. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think that was all I needed to say on sawing. So the question is, are there additional questions? Are there specific sawing issues that people are encountering that you need help with? Um, and would you, based on what I've told you tonight, would you be able to fire up a video camera and diagnose any sawing issues that you have? Would you know what to look for? That's the important part. You want to be able to walk away from this presentation, lecture, class, whatever you want to call it, and be able to replicate it and fix these issues at home on your own. Uh, what are the differences between a tenon sash and carcassol? That's from William. Um, William, I will, I will absolutely answer that question, but I also urge you to dig into my channel a little bit here on YouTube and look for the presentation I did on saws um, from Woodworking in America in 2016. Uh, there is a, a, a full-blown lecture presentation there on all the differences of the various saws, what makes them, what defines them, um, pictures, pretty pictures, and a, even a PDF handout that you can download. Um, and there's a lot more data there. Quickly, the difference between a, um, what did we say, tenon sash and carcass saw. The function, first of all, a tenon saw is used to, go figure, cut tenons. So a tenon saw is going to be a rip file tooth because tenons are rip cuts. A tenon saw is also going to be longer and it's going to be deeper under the back because think about it, a tenon, you know, you may have a two inch long tenon, you need to at least be able to make a two inch long cut or a three inch long cut or a four inch long cut. Most of the bridal joints that I cut are generally three to three and a half inches long. So you need, this is a four and a half inches under the back. It's, 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 it's a big one. You can make, you know, bench jointer with this. But most importantly, it is a rip cut and it's, it's anywhere from 14 to 18 inches long. Most people will tell you 16 to 18 is the tenon saw. I like to say it picks up where the sash saw leaves off. Uh, sash saw is generally 14 inches. The tenon saw can be 14 to even 20 inches long. I like to think 16 to 18 is the sweet spot for a tenon saw. Personally, I like a longer tenon saw. I like a taller tenon saw. You've got a lot more balance and control with the bigger saw. So that's the tenon saw. It's designed to do what its name says, cut tenons. Let me go to the carcass saw before I talk about the sash saw. The carcass saw is designed for carcass work. We're sawing case pieces to final dimension. So this is a cross cut operation. If I have, I'm making a small bookshelf. I want to size this. This is a side panel to the bookshelf. I want to size it to final length. That is a cross cut operation. I'm going to cross cut that. It's going to have a certain amount of precision. It's going to be a finer cut saw and it's going to be a cross cut file tooth, 12 inches long and a medium depth under the back. The sash saw is the bigger brother to that. It's a 14 inch long saw. It can be pitched about the same, if not maybe a little bit finer. And it is also a cross cut saw. The reason it's called a sash saw is it was meant for sawing sash, window sash. Um, well, why do you need a longer saw to saw window sash? Window sash, they're narrower pieces, right? Shouldn't you be better off with a shorter saw for that? Window sash made accurately revolves around ganging your parts together. So if I have four parts to a window, right? Two rails, two styles, and I want to lay out um, all of the shoulders on those tenons. In order to end up with a square window, those shoulders have to be positioned precisely. So rather than saw each one individually, you take them and you stack them all together. You gang them up and you make one shoulder cut. So you've had a wider board here. You've got four pieces of sash, maybe two inches wide. You end up with an eight inch wide board that you're cutting and you make that tenon cut, that tenon shoulder cut all in one pass. You make the, the muntin cut in the middle all in one pass. And that ends up being a much more precise way to cut sash. More importantly, if you're cutting one window, you're probably cutting two, three, four, five windows. So say you've got eight windows to do and they're rectangular. So the, the shoulders on the vertical members all need to be in the same place and they all need to fit into the same sized hole in the wall. You want that as precise as possible. So you gang them together and you make it in one saw cut. That's why the sash saw is a little bit longer saw. Um, 
that's a, a bit of, a, of an esoteric example, um, maybe somewhat anachronistic. What I really like it for is wider cross cuts like dado work. Again, if I wanted to put a dado in this 12 inch wide board, I'd be better off cutting it with a sash saw that's already a little bit longer than the board than I would with a shorter carcass saw. Plus I've got a um, little bit more a little bit more better, a little bit more better sawdust excavation just because they've got more teeth, more gullets to carry the sawdust out of the way. This is one of those tools that you got to have a lot of saws before you can say, you know what, I really need a sash saw. You should have certainly a tenon saw and a dovetail saw and probably a carcass saw before you even think about uh, a sash saw, um, let alone a sash saw with a custom tea candle like I did. <laughs> I have a problem, people. I have a, I have a saw problem. So those are the differences. There's a lot of other very specific things about pitch, depth under the back and all that stuff. And that's why I recommend you go check out that lesson uh, that I recorded from Woodworking in America. It goes into all those in much greater detail. Which one of these saws would work best for resawing? Um, yes. <laughs> resawing is a rip cut, right? Um, it depends upon the type of board you're resawing. If I were resawing just this little board, tenon saw is just fine. Cause that's all, I mean, a tenon, the act of sawing a tenon cheek is a resaw, if you think about it. So a tenon saw would be perfectly fine for this. If I were resawing this board, I would want a longer saw. And of the saws that I showed, I would go with a five points per inch rip saw like this. This is not the most optimum saw for resawing. It's too, um, the gullets aren't big enough. I would go with an actual frame saw mint for resawing. Uh, I really should not intertwine my power cables with my tools. I have another live session here on my channel entirely on resawing. So again, I recommend you dig a little bit further into my channel, search for resawing, and you will see a whole lesson specifically on resawing and also on using this four foot beast. This thing, I have resawed boards as small as this. I've also resawed boards 24, 28 inches wide. I have a smaller 36 inch version that I've used to resaw veneer on, you know, six inch wide uh, stock. It's a rip cut. Ultimately, the wider the board, the coarser the teeth you want to be because the finer the teeth, the smaller the gullets, which means you can't transport as much sawdust out of the cut to outside the board. And the sawdust starts to gum things up. It prevents the saw from cutting efficiently. It heats things up. It causes the saw to deviate, and move off your line. This is a three points per inch monster that um, excavates sawdust like nobody's business. This saw cuts faster than my old Grizzly uh, 14 inch bandsaw. So again, for specific resawing stuff, I urge you to check out my resawing live session. Um, there was a lot of good info. I think good info. Maybe it wasn't good info, I don't know. Uh, when, David wants to know, when would you ditch sawing a rip cut and go to a scrub or four plane? Ooh, good question. Um, and the answer to that is imaginingly, it depends. It depends on what the waste looks like. The rule of thumb that I use, um, and this goes for resawing or planing or ripping, um, those you don't know, I prefer, prefer to use a scrub plane for actually reducing the width of a board. Uh, it's really fast and efficient when working on an edge like this. I guess if I were to go with a rule of thumb, I would say less than an inch. If I had less than an inch, ah, maybe less than three quarters of an inch. If I had less than three quarters of an inch, I could remove that with a scrub plane in probably 20 seconds. Um, it would take me at least 30 seconds, 45 seconds, just to clamp it down on my bench with hold fast, go get my saw and make the cut. Whereas I can clamp it in a vise, grab my scrub plane, and well, set it for a depth of cut and maybe not that deep of a cut. Getting a bit aggressive. I'm 
should have marked out a line. But these shavings are easily a sixteenth of an inch. Correction, they're an eighth of an inch thick. So eight passes technically and I'm, I'm, I'm down an inch. Um, that's fuzzy math. Don't pay attention to that. Uh, so it, it is a matter of what is that board? If this were a much thicker board, if this were eight quarter stock, the scrub plane would require more overlapping cuts and I may not go that way. I could switch over to a four plane and go that way, but probably it would just be faster to go ahead and rip the cut um, if it were a thicker board. If I am resawing something, I always ask myself, what am I gonna do with the off cut? Now, if I'm bisecting a board and trying to make two boards out of one, resawing is the obvious choice. If I have a board that is a half an inch too thick for what my finished thickness needs to be, a, I would redesign my piece and go, why do I need it to be that thin? Or maybe try to find another board. If that was, you already considered all that and it needs to be a half inch thinner. If I resaw that, um, and I've got a half inch of waste to remove, there's gonna be the width of the kerf that's gonna remove that. So, you know, we'll say that pulls a 16th out of the equation. My half inch is now um, three eighths. No. Yeah, basically it's going to be about three eighths, a little bit heavy of three eighths. Well, if I saw that away, what is that little piece going to do? Do I have a use for that three eighths inch thick piece? More than likely that three inch inch thick piece is going to cup and bow and turn into a potato chip because you've got this little thin piece, you've opened up all this moisture and it's liable to warp heavily on you. If you don't have any specific use for that, it may be just as fast to grab that scar plane or that four plane and turn that half an inch into shavings which you can then throw in your fire pit and keep you warm when it's nine degrees outside like tonight. So it's a highly subjective question. You have to ask yourself, you know, what's the size of the board? What's the level of effort gonna be? If it's a 22 inch wide board, resawing it is hard work on that, thick of a, on that wide of a board. Planing it is hard work as well, but it's still gonna be less work, I think, than doing the resaw. And you're probably gonna end up with a more usable board in the long run. So, you know, it, it's a highly variable thing. Think each through, figure out what's going to take more time, what's going to take more effort, and more importantly, what am I going to do with that off cut? If you're sawing, you're producing an off cut. If you're planing, your off cut is, is waste. It's all just shavings. So do I have a use for that off cut? If so, then you probably want to saw it. You're welcome, William. I'm happy to help. Um, again, please uh, check out that lesson. It's like an hour long. No, it's almost a two hour long lesson. Um, put a lot of effort into preparing that. So uh, uh, you'll find just about everything you need to know about sawing in that point. So um, I've got 7.30, which means I probably need to cut this off. And let me just make sure I haven't missed any particular questions. I think I got them all. Okay, Chris was trying to ask a question and apparently wasn't showing up. So um, Chris wants to know, what does it indicate about your body mechanics if your handsaw wobbles and flexes while sawing? That indicates that your body mechanics are pulling that saw more than likely off plumb. It could be pulling it off square. Let me just clarify that, that terminology. I'm not saying that this is, you know, uh, set in stone, but if I've got... I consider off square to be in relation to the face. I consider off plumb to be in relation to the thickness, the vertical motion. Um, if the saw is flexing and it's binding or it's wobbling or it's creating that really loud, obnoxious rattle sound, you are forcing that saw to bend. You're forcing that saw to move in a geometric plane that it does not want to do. And the teeth are binding. The teeth are vibrating excessively because of that. So what I do, um, if I'm ripping and I feel that it's binding or it's catching or wobbling or something like that, I will, um, you know what, let me just show you. So I'm sawing along. <laughs> this is binding because it started with a thinner Japanese saw curve. 
So it's starting to rattle. I will move myself, my whole body to the left, and I'll move it to the right until that rattle, that rattling sound stops. Or what feels like it's wobbling, it feels like it's binding, will suddenly become easy again. Again, sawing in line is quite easy. There's very little physical effort involved. And I don't know if it picks up on the camera or not, it's quiet. As I move off, the rattle starts to pick up, the whole process becomes harder, and the saw teeth start to, what I say, growl a little bit more. They make a little bit noise. They're vibrating a little bit more. And as you move back and forth, you will feel it. It will be obvious when you fall into that line. In fact, what you'll notice is that suddenly, hey, who shifted gears? I'm in a different ring now. This is a heck of a lot easier. And as you move further and further back, that rattle may kick up again, that binding and that wobble may kick up again, because what's happening is I move further back. If you remember, I'm forcing my body to do weird things. So I take that step forward, I push my board forward, and suddenly it becomes easy again. So that's the one thing that I can, I can't echo enough here. Hand sawing, whether it's ripping like this or back sawing or anything, certainly it's physical exercise. There's a certain amount of physical effort required to do it, but it is a lot less than what most people make it out to be. It is not, you know, kill yourself. You should be able to saw for a long, long time and not end up with massive shoulder pain. Now you may raise your heart rate, your breath may you know, catch a little bit because it is cardiovascular exercise. It is not heavy muscular exercise. The saw is the muscle. It's doing all the work. It's like spinning on a bike at a high cadence with low resistance. It's cardiovascular. It's not cranking the resistance up with a low cadence. Sorry, I've got a spinning bike in the corner. <laughs> um, it, so really you should be able to saw for a long period of time without having massive shoulder pain, having your shoulder feel really, really sore and tired. If that's the case, something is off. Either your body mechanics are wrong, the saw is dull, or the saw is set improperly, the wood is binding or something like that. The physical muscle strength required to saw is actually a heck of a lot less than you actually think it needs to be. And certainly than you know, the zeitgeist wants us to believe. So, cool. Um, you know what, why not? Josiah wants to know if I can talk about overhand sawing technique. Um, wait, overhand sawing technique for ripping with a thumb hole or Overhand sawing technique. Um, yeah, uh, and again, I've got a, a video on my channel that talks about specifically sawing without a saw bench. That talks a little bit about that. The thumb hole technique, this can be really good as you get near the end of the board, you don't have anything to, to kneel on, but there's really not a huge amount of difference here. I'm stepping forward. If I'm back here and I try to hook my thumb through the hole, you will find that your cut will want to drag to the right because what I'm doing is this, is, this, is, this arm is kind of pulling things over. So you do have to, again, step forward. And I, what I will do is actually angle the saw up closer to 90 degrees and use the thumb hole. Um, again, this is a left or right-handed thumb hole. So it's actually meant, it's, it's more contoured to work like that, because there's this little relief area that just feels better when you reach across with your left hand. It's another thing, a certain amount of ambidexterity is a good thing, because if your arm does get tired, switch to your other arm. But the technique itself doesn't change that much. I will find, however, with some of the thumb holes, uh, I've got another one there, I'll just use this. With some of the thumb hole grip, if your saw starts to drift one way or another, it's because you are either lowering the angle down too much um, or don't have your weight forward, just like it would with a regular rip saw. So what I would do is angle it up closer to 90 degrees, take that step forward, and really focus on, think of this extra arm as more of like an outrigger, more as balance than exerting any amount of force. Because the more force you exert, the center of that force is from over here. It's cantilevered out here, and you put too much force on it, it is going to want to pull the saw one way or another. This is just kind of 
additional guidance, additional balance. If you start to see it deviate, relax this hand. Even pull your thumb or pull your fingers out and just rely on pressing down with the thumb or angle it up a little bit higher. And that will correct a lot of those issues. For the most part, it's the same issues that we're always dealing with, keeping your body out of the way of the cut. Um, it's just that when you add that extra hand through the thumb hole, it does kind of throw the cut off a little bit. You have to be conscious of that. The, what I call the overhand grip, I think is actually referred to most commonly as the English sawing method. Is it the English sawing method? French sawing method, I don't know. It's the workbench sawing method. This is where a panel saw can be beneficial. And in this case, I'm sawing with the whole thing up a little bit higher. I don't actually have my hand through the grip. I've got my thumb, my fingers through here, my thumb through the top. You don't have to have a thumb hole grip for this. I usually am just grabbing it overhand and sawing vertically. Let me, don't do that. Don't fall. Let me move this out of the way. The beauty of this technique is you can step back and you can actually sight down your saw pulley a little bit more and you can see vertical. Whereas when you're over top of it, you can't see vertical. This really gives you a better look at that. It's not as efficient though, because you, just the way the body mechanics are, you really can't use the whole saw stroke. Um, I'm only using maybe a third of the plate here uh, when I do that, but it can be a very precise way of sawing, especially with a panel saw and you really don't want to do a bunch of follow-up cutting there. That's what I consider to be the overhand sawing grip or the English sawing method. Um, do you like the Lee Nielsen panel saws? I've used them briefly. They're fine. I don't really have an issue with them. Um, when you're talking about a panel saw, you have to be very conscious of why do you need a panel saw. A panel saw, kind of like the sash saw, is um, it's a very specific use item. Uh, and, and you're going to find a lot less use for a finer pitched backless saw or panel saw than you will for a full size hand saw. The reason panel saws have become popular again is because panel saws are a heck of a lot cheaper and easier to make than a full size saw. The reason that Bad Axe is really one of the first people in a long time to make taper ground plates just like Diston did is because it's really expensive and a lot of the machining required to do this doesn't exist anymore. Um, Mark took probably six years of R&D to figure out how to do this, to create this quality of a saw, and it's an expensive saw. Um, there are some manufacturers out there doing it, but they're not producing the same quality type of steel, craftsmanship, and taper grinding that Bad Axe is producing. It was a lot easier to do that with a smaller saw plate. So panel saws, Lee Nielsen came up with panel saws, what, eight years ago, seven years ago? Um, and, and that has been kind of become the de facto backless saw and everyone's thinking I need to buy a Lee Nielsen saw. So I have no problem with Lee Nielsen panel saws used as panel saws. Where I have a problem is I know so many people who bought them expecting it to perform like this, expecting it to work for rough breakdown of stock, working with eight quarter material, even four quarter material, and they find out that it's really slow and it's a lot of work because it's a finely pitched saw that cuts really slowly, clogs up with sawdust because the gullets are really tiny. It's just not meant for that type of work. It's meant for this type of work. This board is already S2S and it's probably seven eighths of an inch thick. Even that is starting to test what a panel saw is designed to do. So great saws, if you use them how they're intended to be used, not like this. So it's kind of a, um, it's kind of a button of mine, <laughs> if you haven't figured it out, by the pitch and the timbre of my voice there. All right, um, make sure I'm not missing anything. Do you believe in a knife line, then chisel cut for beginners? For a saw cut, no. I think that's, no, no. Um, I guess there's nothing wrong with it. What, what, what he's asking is, do you believe in um, essentially making a first class saw cut? Now, wait a minute, let's clarify that. 
for this type of cut or the type of cut on the saw bench or anything like that, that's just ludicrous. Why would, first of all, if it's a rough, saw, rough cut board, a knife line's not gonna really do much for me there. It doesn't make any sense. If we're talking about joinery, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. If you're talking about tenon shoulders, very precise cuts, the more precise your cut gets, the more precise your marking method should be. In which case, a knife line is a great idea. A first class cut or that um, shoulder cut, um, the, the term that Paul Sellers seems to have invented is knife wall, um, although I think Rubo used that term as well. Um, the knife wall idea, the first class saw cut, I think is what Waring, Robert Waring called it. Um, yeah, I think it's a good idea for precision saw cuts. It has no place in panel saws or, or hand saws. I just don't think you need that level of precision because the set of the saw, the roughness, the coarseness of that saw cut is going to defeat any knife line you're doing anyway. And that goes with all hand work. The more precise the expected results should be, the more precise everything along the way needs to be. Your layout needs to be precise. The tool you use needs to be made to cut precisely in order to end up with a precise fit. Um, you can certainly cut dovetails with a, a, a rip saw like that. It's possible, I've done it. It's a heck of a lot harder than using a dovetail saw, a surgically precise tool like a dovetail saw. So um, I don't do the whole first class slash knife wall cut as much anymore because I don't find that it's necessarily um, that much of an aid. Um, if I'm doing a really wide cut, like a dado cut, or again, a really precise cut, like a sliding dovetail cut across a 12 inch wide board, and I really want that cut to be dead accurate, I will use a knife wall and I'll use a fence to ride the saw up against that fence. If I'm cutting a 10 inch shoulder anymore, Let's talk more doing, Shannon. Shut up and do. If I'm gonna cut a tenon shoulder, I'm gonna lay it out with a knife. So I've got my level of precision here with the knife. But for me, that knife line is enough. I don't find that I necessarily need to come in and create that first class saw cut because all the same principles that I just talked about to make that cut, to line up that cut, to execute and commit to that cut with a full length straw, saw cut will end up right on that knife line. And I'm not actually finding that the, the knife wall, the first class cut, is actually doing all that much guidance. In order to create a serious amount of, like an actual knife wall to work against, you have to end up making multiple knife passes, really deepen that in. Um, and then you gotta come back with the chisel, find something to work against. And you've got to create a substantial V cut or trough here. Now the saw is actually resting in there, but you'll find that if you're not paying attention, if your body's out of alignment, this saw will jump out of that knife wall with no effort at all. So if my body's out of alignment here, bam, I just jumped right out of there. The knife wall is not preventing it and keeping it in there. So it comes down to a question of how much effort do you want to put into the preparation of that cut versus how much time or how much do you rely upon your tools to cut straight? And if your body is out of alignment, your tool is not going to cut straight. But if you've aligned your body, there's no reason to do that knife wall. I'm almost hesitant to say that because it's not like the knife wall is a bad idea, but I do find that it slows you down. Um, and as you get the, one of the biggest calls to arms that I'm always, calls to arms, is that a word? Calls to action, rallying cries. One of the biggest things that I'm always preaching is that hand tools don't have to be slow. And we tend to make them slow because we add all this other stuff into the way. The knife wall can be something if you're, if you're, if you're really terrified, you're gonna screw up the cut, add some insurance in there, but you're gonna find very quickly that you 
for lack of a better term, graduate beyond that extra step of pulling out the chisel and just working straight off the knife line will be all you need. So, cool guys. I got nothing else to say. That's enough. I think, I hope, um, if you guys have other questions, by all means, hit me up on my website um, or submit questions and come back next month and we'll talk some more. So everybody have a happy new year. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for asking questions. Always appreciated. Have a pleasant evening.